Uh, so I'm John Woodward. I'm a reporter at CTV Vancouver and a proud UBC alumnus. So I'm thrilled to be here. It was really interesting, fantastic to listen to that talk. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, I'm going to start with a couple questions of my own, but obviously you in the audience and out there on the internet have Slido, so please uh, continue to submit your questions. They're being approved right now. I can see a list already, but I'm up here so I get to ask the questions first. Uh, so like I said, I'm, a, I'm a, a UBC alumnus. I have a math degree, and I started in Science 1. And so every chance I get as a reporter, I try and bring that to the table. You know, I try and use my degree somehow Good. in my work. Uh, not just to help other reporters calculate percentages. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask you, uh, as, as a science communicator, how has winning the Nobel Tri Prize changed your ability to communicate science? Well, I mean, certainly people want to listen to me now, and they didn't before. <laughs> um, and I was working with the Optical Society uh, when I was president of the Optical Society, which is an international organization, uh, but based in the United States. They started a, a new national photonics initiative. And I couldn't really be part of that because that nation's not my nation. And I said, that's okay. But when you, you know, finish doing it in the United States, this is an international organization and let's talk about it. And so I'm part of their international photonics advocacy coalition. And we thought, well, you can't just go from government to government because we can't know what each government cares about. So we decided that everybody was signing on to the Paris Accord. And light is a great way to as, work as a sensor for all kinds of things. And so we decided that that's what we would focus our energy on. So when I tried to get my first meeting uh, together uh, a little over a year, two years ago now, I guess, uh, we could not get Environment Canada to show up at the table and hear what we had to say. And so then I thought, okay, um, the scientists have to get together and come up with a better elevator spit speech so that the, you know, um, the environmental policy makers want to listen to you. So it was scheduled for November 8th last year at uh, the National Research Council in Boucherville. And then, of course, uh, the announcement comes out October 2nd. And wouldn't you know, Environment Canada uh, comes to that meeting. And, uh, and then I actually got invited to their um, policy meeting because they wanted to hear from me. Um, and so, yeah, people uh, listen more. And uh, so now I have to be more careful what I say. <laughs> Did you have a sense that your life would change that much when you got the call from Sweden? Well, I never thought I was going to get a call from Sweden, so I never really thought about it. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think people really can fathom it. I will tell you that it gave me a whole new sense of what poor little Justin Bieber went through, who was just 30, you know, 30 kilometers from Waterloo. And I thought, how did that poor 15-year-old kid you know, because I have, I've sort of tasted a little bit of fame, but nothing on the orders of magnitude like that. And, you know, and I was 60 and he was just, you know, 15. Uh, and so it is a, a life-changing thing to go through. Uh, and at least I, I assume he put himself out on YouTube because he wanted to be famous, where I was not somebody who was trying to be famous. So uh, it is quite changing. What, what was it like that morning to get that call? Um... Well, I mean, like, it is also surreal, and it's also exciting, um, but then you get the call at 5 in the morning, and I'm hanging on to my husband going, oh my gosh, I think this is the call from uh, the Nobel Prize, I can't believe it. They tell you, can you be ready for 6, so for me, it would be 6 a.m., I mean, they say noon, but uh, a 6 a.m. Uh, teleconference. So... I get up and I get showered and changed and my husband's making me coffee and then we're on the phone at 6 by 6.15. I mean, my phone just goes beep, 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 and it didn't stop all day. It just kept doing that. And next, uh, by 7 a.m., I've got um, a photographer there. I have, now, at the same time, we were redoing our bathroom, so the plumber is there and they... <laughs> I, my neighbor has come with flowers. I have the plumber saying he wants to turn off the water. I've got a, a, a reporter on the phone. I've got a photographer in my house. And it's like, whoa. And then, you know, I, I said to the plumber, yes, turn off the water without really thinking because I didn't know what to do. And then I try to get some lunch. You know, like, so all day, so by 7.30, somebody from the University of Waterloo said, we'll take over the media. I went, good, because I don't know what I'm doing. And they said, we'll have a press conference, come in, da, da, da. So then I realize I can't even make myself a cup of coffee because I've got no water. So then I go in and I meet the president of the university. He says, now what can I do for you? I said, first, could you just get me a cup of coffee because I can't cope. So it was that kind of day. Um, but then I have to say I have the sweetest husband because he called 
the uh, food critic from the local paper and said, where should I take my wife who's just won the Nobel Prize out for celebratory <laughs> dinner? And we went to the nicest place in town and uh, had a lovely dinner and that was the first sort of calm moment. But, but I mean, I, just before that, I talked to the Prime Minister of Canada, right? Mm -hmm. And Justin Trudeau, and I say to him, I say, you know, this is maybe like your day every day, but this is really weird for me. And he said, no, Donna, every day, I don't get to talk to a Nobel Prize winner every day. And I went, oh, you're good, okay. <laughs> so, you know, and then we're on our way to the restaurant and Kirsty Duncan, the Minister of Science, calls me up and he goes, I was just talking to the Prime Minister, I know your husband's taking you out for dinner. I went, oh my goodness, I got people talking about me at the government. I, <laughs> how weird is that? So, yeah, it was a weird day. <laughs> weird day. Weird day. <laughs> Began at six in the morning. And just kept on yeah. going, yeah. So that, that's what, three in the morning our time? Mm, yeah, yeah so, so you'll get the call at 2 a.m. out here. You've been warned, scientists in the audience. Right, so have your cell you phone right for. ready with you those days if you want to know. So take me back to, to, to your childhood. How did you know you wanted to be in physics? I don't know that I did. Um, I think if you asked me in high school, I probably would have said I wanted to do math. Uh, and I probably saw myself going to the University of Waterloo to do math. I grew up just uh, 50 kilometers away. Uh, but I was a very shy kid. And I just somewhere along the way thought I shouldn't be that shy. That's no way to go through life. And my sister was already at Waterloo in engineering. And my best friend was going to go. And I thought, if I just go to Waterloo, I'm just going to, you know, hang out with them. And, and so I thought, no, I'm just going to go to some university I don't know anybody at. And so then I started looking around, and that's when I saw lasers and electro-optics as part of the engineering physics program at McMaster. And that just, it just sang to me. I just went, that just sounds like too much fun. Let's do that. Yeah. So off I went. I just, I'm a seat of the pants kind of person. <laughs> Well, lasers are, are pretty cool, They're cool. I mean, right now. Definitely. And this was definitely, this was in the 70s, right? It's yeah. not like now where you see them in the grocery store or in a dollar store or whatever. Yeah. I mean, you know, the lasers were not around. They, they were really a research thing. Yeah, so that you wouldn't have seen them quite the same, capture the same public imagination quite the same way at that no. time. No, but I think that they were more mysterious probably in my day. <laughs> so that made them more interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. right. All right. How did, uh, how did you end up going to the University of Rochester? Well, so then I worked uh, one summer uh, with uh, a laser group at McMaster, and I just talked to those grad students and said, where would, you know, where should I go if I want to keep studying lasers? And uh, the one student, now he, he sort of lied to me because he said, well, if I had to do it over again, I think I would go to Rochester or Arizona, which were the two optic schools. Now, he finished his master's and then went to Berkeley, so obviously he was doing it all over again, and he hadn't said that to me. So I don't know what, maybe he thought I wasn't smart enough, I don't know. Um, and so I tried Rochester and Arizona, and I got accepted at Rochester, and then I phoned Arizona, which young people aren't even going to understand this, but daytime, long distance calling all the way down to Arizona, and they said, we don't even have your file, and they put me on hold. And they came back on the line, and they said, we found your file, but see, Rochester is a private school, and Arizona is a state school, which as a Canadian, I hardly understood the difference. Um, but you don't have to go through a foreign student office to a private school, whereas you do for a state school. And they said, we found your file, it's still in the Foreign Student Affairs Office, and so we never saw it, and so no, you won't be getting accepted into Arizona. So I said, I guess I'll go to Rochester then. So there you go. <laughs> um, were, were, you, um, were you ever considering a second career? You know, if, if you weren't a Nobel Prize winning physicist, what would you have been? Well, just a regular physicist. <laughs> 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 yeah. Not like, yeah. you know, no, accountant think, or construction no, worker or no. something Well, like first of all, I would say that I always knew I belonged in school. You know, I was one of those kids that was happy to have summer vacation over. I was ready to go back to school. So I knew I belonged in school always. So I think that's where I'm comfortable. So, um, now I would never be a doctor. People would say, well, you're so smart. Why don't you become a medical doctor? I went, well, because I faint at the sight of blood. So it, I would be pretty bad at that. So... Okay, well, I'm going to go for the first one uh, on the Slido now, and this is the overwhelming favorite in terms of, of likes, which is, what were the challenges faced by you as a woman in the field of science? I don't know that I really faced, other than, you know, being married uh, to a man, because most men could not be married to women because there weren't any, and, uh, but most women just, you know, you look here, you look there, there's a man. So we're mostly married to scientists, so that, so we have the two-body problem more than men. So I will say that. So just trying to get two science jobs in the same place is by far and away the biggest hurdle. So as we get more women, then men are going to find us, and then they'll have the same problem. Um, so that's the biggest challenge. I mean, I always like to, uh, I'm a very positive person, and so I usually spin things uh, good ways. Um, 
So actually, I mean, so here's my funny, I have a lot of funny stories about it, but um, it's sort of like the Big Bang Theory from the TV show kind of moment. Uh, so my very first summer job at McMaster, uh, the laser group was in a sub-basement, there was three separate sub-basements, and I guess usually if a woman showed up in this particular sub-basement, they were looking for audiovisual, and so the guys were used to saying audiovisuals down the other stairwell. Anyway, I come down, and before they look at me and I said, you know, that I was the new summer student and all they just stood there. It's like about eight guys around getting their coffee, all staring at me with their mouths hanging open and they didn't know what to say. And I find out that the professor earlier had said having a girl in the lab would be nothing but trouble. And so when they told me that afterwards, I said, but my name is Donna, like it's kind of a girl's name. And they said, no, he didn't give us your name. So we didn't know until you came down that, that he, had, he had actually said that but still hired a girl. And then, what was, that wasn't the funny thing. The funny thing was, now they put me here, I'm sitting there reading the master's thesis so I know what I'm doing, and this other guy, grad student, is back in this lab working, and just every five or ten minutes, in comes a guy and goes back to visit this guy. And I go, I wonder why he's so popular and how does he ever get any work done? So after an hour or two, he comes out of the lab and goes, I'm not going to get any work done. He says, the word's gone out to all of physics that we have a girl down here and they're all coming to check you out. Oh, boy. I said, I wondered what was making you so popular. <laughs> so you were talking about the, the, the laser race, I guess you could call it, mm -hmm. a little earlier. Um, and and I, I mean, I know a lot of science discoveries come by accident. I thought I'd ask you, there's, a, there's an interesting story about how it, uh, lasers went from your lab to the kind of video uh, laser surgery that we saw. So mm -hmm. I, I thought it'd be neat to ask you about that story. So, yeah, so this also happened in Gerard's lab. He had moved to Michigan by that time. And I have to say... Um, if CPA had stayed with the Yag and Glass what I talked about, it would not be the big thing that it was. But at the same time we were developing that, along came Titanium Dope Sapphire, and it just changed uh, the whole laser business. But with my laser, it was infrared. As I showed, you couldn't see the beam. And so you could leave safety goggles on. You couldn't see the beam with it without your safety goggles. But Thai Sapphire is one where it just, it's, it's closer to what you can see, and in the tails of this very broad bandwidth, you can see it. It looks like a weak beam. It looks weaker than a red um, point, laser pointer, but it's really a one-watt beam, and it looks like a milliwatt. And so you, you can sort of think to yourself that you shouldn't be worried about it. Uh, so, so it's much easier to see it if you take your goggles off, though, instead of trying to use an IR viewer. And so I think too many people... Uh, so laser eye damage went way up when Thai Sapphire came along. Um, so that's why we have to have much stricter rules now. Uh, anyways, this poor student in Gerard's group got the laser in his eye and, uh, and damaged, not perma well, he probably damaged permanently his retina, but your brain takes over after a while and, and you don't see that dead spot anymore. But anyway, uh, when it happened, of course, panic ensued and they rush off to the hospital and the, it was an uh, intern, uh, ophthalmology intern that saw the damage and while he was inspecting it, he said, what kind of laser? And they're going, what does it matter what kind of laser? I'm worried about my eye. And he goes, but the, the damage is so perfect. Now, if it was a regular C, yeah, if it was a regular CW that was a thermal process, it would have been more like a tear or, or like a blob, right? But it was a perfect little round hole because it was only exactly where, as I point out, where the focal spot was on the retina. And of course, your eye will focus the light onto your retina. So it was just a very tiny dot, which is why the brain can take over and just ignore that dead spot now. Um, and so they decided to work together to see if they could use that kind of laser to do something useful rather than damaging uh, with it. And that's how it all got started. They went straight to the patent office, I'm guessing. Yes, and I think that guy, the <laughs> uh, ophthalmologist, has made some really big bucks on his uh, laser <laughs> surgery. Yeah. Not bad. Do you have any laser scars? No, um, well, I mean, I've, I've probably hurt my, like, you know, if you get, uh, certainly the pump lasers, you really do feel slapped. Um, and I used to let high school students come in and be slapped by my pump laser, but then um, some people <laughs> thought they were getting themselves hurt, so I thought I better stop this. Uh, <laughs> I just think it's really neat to feel a laser slap like that. I will say, though, uh, back in the day when I still ironed clothes, and I, had, I, just, I was in grad school, and I would bought a shirt that obviously had longer sleeves, and the first time I then ironed it, I saw, you know, 20 or 30 holes through my sleeve um, <laughs> that had gotten in the beams. So, a lot, you know, we all wear fire retardant, so that's why it doesn't... But I have to say, the one guy in the dye laser lab, he, you know, um, came from some money, and he always insisted on wearing a sports coat. I don't know why. 
in the lab and whoa, I'm telling you, in the laser beam stinks like crazy. And so you would smell him if he got in the beam and go, get out of the beam, Merrill, get out of the beam. <laughs> Oh boy. Well, all right. I'm going to go to another one here from Slido, which is how do you deal with setbacks or failures, like experiments not working, funding problems, personnel issues? What's your strategy to bounce back? Well, uh, yeah. So it's, science doesn't work 99% of the time. So you must have patience. Um, I, I believe in walking. Gerard, Gerard answered this question when I was sitting there with him. He's, he goes swimming. Um, I go walking. Uh, I think you have to have a strategy to just to calm down again and just uh, rethink it because you just have to know that it, it will eventually uh, come around. Um, personnel is a tougher one. I, you know, dealing with people is way harder. I, this is why I am somebody who would rather be in a lab and then you can sort of kick your laser if you have to, which you can't do with obviously your students. Um, so yeah, that, that, one, that one's a tougher one and there's, I don't really have a good answer about that. but. Uh, you do have to have a lot of patience if you're going to be a scientist. I think you go down wrong alleys way more often than you go down a right alley. And uh, so like I said, I mean, I was, I was the fourth year of my PhD when I finally got this to work. And I, that's my first paper. So I went down a lot of wrong alleys. No Nobel Prize for personnel. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, another one from Slido here is, how powerful will these lasers get? Like, like I know you had that, uh, that slide up there, but is there a way to illustrate you know, how close we are to a lightsaber. Okay, I don't like lightsabers because they're stupid. Um, <laughs> although I could have shown that picture because on yeah. my third ball, which, you know, so I didn't take three ball gowns, um, it, was, uh, it was a student group and we, and we had to do something to get to this Order of the Frog, which is their science uh, fraternity thing. And they made Gerard and I fight with this uh, toy lightsaber. Um, okay, so the reason why uh, um, lightsabers are stupid is that it's a really just a light bulb, right? I mean, the, if you look at a lightsaber, the light's going in all directions, so it's just a light bulb. So it's the fact that we can concentrate the light in one direction and down to one spot that makes it very powerful. So, so lightsabers are stupid. So, so, so less stupid might be sharks with laser beams. Sharks with laser beams. Um, yes. Okay. I'm just, I was just checking off my bucket list, okay. asking Nobel Prize laureates about silly science, uh, okay. science movie stuff. Uh, all right, so what, what is, uh, what's a conversation that you've had in your career that's really motivated you or made you, uh, been memorable in your career? A conversation that I've had? Hmm, that one's a tough one. Or even something um, someone said to you that made you very unhappy too, because people will say things that will, uh, will discourage scientists. Well, okay, I'll, so let me... Tell you, so in my own lab, uh, we're trying to, uh, I do two color CPA, where it's nonlinear optics using two colors of different colors. And so I got in the laser to finally work, and I was giving like a poster presentation at the big laser conference, and, and saying that the point I was going to do was use it for mid and for run. And I had a big group around asking me a lot of questions, and so some guy was very frustrated that he couldn't get his question answered, and he finally just tapped on that part of my poster and went, that'll never work. I came home and went, okay, now it has to work because if someone tells me my idea is never going to work, I don't care how long it takes, it's going to work because that's, yeah, that's how, I, I definitely get motivated if somebody says my idea won't work. I have to, I have to show them wrong. <laughs> show them up. Uh, you, you're Canadian, you're from Guelph. Mm -hmm. um, you did your PhD, which started you down this road to the Nobel Prize in the United States. Mm -hmm. We often talk in Canada about the brain drain, mm -hmm. smart people who are really valuable to this country leaving. What made you stay, or come back, I should say? What made you come back? I love Canada. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, my husband always wanted to tell, tell this story, so I'm gonna, I, I don't think I've told it publicly. Um, when I started dating him in Rochester, I said, I'll date you, but just trust me, uh, I'm moving home to Canada, and, and nobody's stopping me. Um, and so I did, and he actually, he actually drove the truck for me and moved me up, and then we broke up because he had to move back to the States. Um, and then after a few weeks, I had to call him up and say, okay, I was wrong. So um, I had to eat humble pie on that one. But, um, so yeah, so I always knew that I wanted to live in Canada. I think, uh, you know, Ottawa is my favorite city, and I was thrilled to get to go back there for a postdoc. Um, but then, you know, because I was marrying an American, um, I did, uh, at the time, uh, they had these, the program, and I forget what it was called, but anyways, it was about hiring women uh, into faculty jobs 
with the idea we still have uh, retirements for them. So UBC was actually one of the ones that contacted me uh, and said, do you want to try for one of these awards? And, and I said, well, that sounds good, but I'll be having an American husband by then, so would there be something to go along with that? And at that time, the answer was no. And so I had two Canadian universities uh, ask to do this, and so I said no. Um, and so that's how I ended up going to Livermore. Because, which is nowhere close to where my husband lives in New Jersey, but nevertheless, I was running out of time and had to get a job. But you, yeah, you, you find a way to make it work? Yeah. Well, um, when I took the job at Livermore, I said I will promise to stay at, uh, one year because um, A, it was a good paying job, and B, they paid for my whole move out there and everything. Um, so I said I won't leave less than a year, but I said I'm going to keep trying to find a job with my husband somewhere. Um, but I also got kicked out of the United States that year for getting married to an American. I got kicked out of um, Livermore one night uh, because I'm an alien. I mean, a lot of it was just craziness. And, uh, and so I kept looking and this job came up as a member of technical staff at Princeton, which is really takes me off the academic track, right? Um, I was just somebody to sort of help her person. And I said, fine, I'll give up my career because it was just getting too hard. Uh, and working at a US weapons lab as a Canadian is, is not an easy thing to do. So, um, yeah, so I actually gave up thinking that I would have an academic career at that point. But then, you know, Waterloo hired me a few years later. So. <laughs> and my husband followed me that time. I'd followed him to New Jersey because he was at Bell Labs and he thought it was a great job. But then Bell Labs sort of started to crumble. So one of the things keeping, keeping you from Canada was also opportunities for your husband here as well. Right. Yes. That, well, that's right. I mean, I think the, the two-body problem is the, is the really tough problem. And so when we lived in New Jersey, you know, he was close to his family living in his country, had the dream job, and I had none of that. And then we moved up, you know, 50 kilometers from where I grew up. And so I had my family and my, you know, and my dream job, and, and he was making do. It's hard to get uh, both of us happy at the same time. Yeah. Well, what could we as a, as a government, a Canadian government or as a society, do to, to encourage more physics being done in this country? Spend more money on it. Um, <laughs> I think we are doing better jobs. I think that most universities now do have spousal programs. I think um, so we're recognizing that. Uh, I think, you know, in some ways we've done a lot in the 20 years since I've been back to have a lot more science done and have the CERCs and have these things. I have to say, though, that I quite liked the Canadian system that I moved back to that was a much more egalitarian system. I thought it was working well for Canada, and so to some extent, I don't really like the have and have not idea of mimicking the United States a little bit. Um, but I think it's mostly, um, I can see building centers is an important thing. I think there is reasons that people go to a Stanford or, or Berkeley, right, because once you have that kind of group of people, you'll get more and more. So uh, we probably do need, in some cases, than the big research schools, um, maybe having more money than others. But um, overall, I think we could do a better job spending our money uh, in more efficient ways. And also uh, working together better with industry and hopefully trying to get industry to go, you know, have a long-term view. Well, I've got to go back to Slido here because the far and away favorite here is uh, how have your interactions changed with the academic community after receiving the Nobel Prize? With the academic community? Yeah. Well, I like to say, so the very first uh, talk I gave in January was at my own department and, uh, you know, standing room only. And I pointed out that I could have given this talk any of the 22 years I'd lived there. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I would have been happy, you know, I'm glad if 20 of them had shown up, but now because the people in Sweden had said I'm special, then my own colleagues showed up to hear me give a talk. Um, so it is quite different. Uh, I think people do all of a sudden uh, view you differently, which of course they shouldn't, uh, right? I'm no, I'm no different than I was two years ago, and the work that I uh, supposedly did that was so great was done 35 years ago. So, uh, so it is, it's a little bit strange uh, that I do have sort of almost a halo on my head now. Um, so, but that's, I think that's the main difference. I mean, also, I guess, you know, I just got inducted into the Royal Society and, and into the Canadian Academy of Engineering. And, um, you know, I think I will probably work with these organizations more. The one that I'm definitely signed up for, uh, as I pointed out, Asia has gone well ahead of North America. So there was, in the United States, a National Academy uh, um, study done to say, look at high-intensity lasers started in the United States with this work. 
and now we're being left in the dust. That's not exactly the way they say it in the report, but that's what they mean. And, um, and Europe is doing a lot too, because Gerard went back and got them to invest billions of dollars in it there. Uh, and so they've started up this US laser net and they've asked me to be part of it and maybe they'll call it now laser net North America. Uh, we do have uh, one big laser here in Canada that's in Montreal. And, um, and I'll, I'll take part in this fight now to uh, see if we can't get going again in North America. Thanks. For, for the young scientists in the audience and watching online, what is the best piece of advice you'd give them? Where is the science headed now? Where, where should they be going and looking to make a great career? Well, see, I've always had uh, a fear of that. I remember, so when I was doing this laser work, uh, it was during, um, or, well, it, when I started, it wasn't true, but Reagan came in and, and Reagan had Star, the Reagan Star Wars going on. And um, Gerard's group just really multiplied by a lot of people. And, and we would have students working with us and that didn't really seem to have that much interest in it. And I remember asking them, I said, why are you working with Gerard on this? Thing. He goes, well, it's because there's so many great jobs in lasers. And I'm going, yeah, but it takes us seven years to get a PhD, and who knows if that's going to be true in seven years. You should do what you really want to do, because that's how you'll do a really good job, right? And I think most of them sort of did just leave the group, because I think if to stick it out, you have to really enjoy it. So I don't really think that one should ever pick something based on what's the hot topic now, because not very many things stay a hot topic in the long run. So uh, you should just pick a field you really want to work in and uh, make the most of it. All right, and I think we're coming close to the end, so I've got time for one more question. I'm torn, but it, again, is the runaway favorite, so I'm going to ask you a bunch of words here, and I hope they make sense. Uh, <laughs> runaway favorite, <laughs> but no sense. Okay. <laughs> Why does stripping the electron from the positron in a vacuum imply creating matter directly from light, and what are the implications? I don't know what the implications are other than just the fun of seeing it. Um, <laughs> you'd have to ask a particle physicist tech, tech person that. Um, so, so what was it? Like, why, why uh, can we do it? Is that what the question yeah, is? Why does stripping the electron from the positron in a vacuum imply creating matter directly from light, and what are the okay. implications? Oh, okay. So, of course, this is the other thing Einstein uh, taught us, that E equals mc squared, and so that energy and mass is the same thing, and, and this is how fusion and fission work also, is that, that if you change the mass, then you just can create energy out of it. So um, at 10 to the 29 watts per square centimeter, what that says is that if you take the mass of an electron and the mass of a positron, it's the same mass, then you take the energy of that to m, you know, mc squared. And then there's something called the Compton wavelength. That is sort of the distance between the electron and the positron there. And so the force would be that energy divided by that distance. And that is the same as the energy per unit distance in this at 10 to the 29 watts per square centimeter. And so you would have vacuum, which is supposedly nothing, and you would focus in your light, and all you'd have is nothing and light, and then all of a sudden the electrons and positrons would just start pouring out because you've, you're just uh, making, you'd have to be slightly above 10 to the 29, or they probably would go right back together, but if you have more, you would just blow them apart. A real let there be light moment. Exactly. Wow. Um, so our last question for you, we're almost out of time, which is I thought, again, again for people watching, is what's, what's the best piece of advice you got as a young scientist, and, and what's the best piece of advice you'd give? Oh, what's the best piece of advice I've got? Um, hmm. <laughs> I guess to go to Rochester, because that turned out really good for me. Uh, and uh, what's the one that I give? Um, I think actually uh, to say that it is a team sport uh, and that, um, and I think there's a huge disconnect between undergrad and, so I even told my own daughter this, she, she considered dropping out of physics. I shouldn't say, talk about my daughter when I'm out in public, but anyway. Um, and I said, no, try to really get a summer job and see what physics really is because it's not that much like undergrad classes. But also, you know, when she was struggling trying to learn it, I, I said, look, it is a team sport. We can't understand everything just talking to ourselves in our own head. You have to have a conversation with somebody else and get their ideas and, and have it go back and forth. And it's with that conversation that helps you understand in your own head what's going on a bit more. All right. I think that is time. Thanks very much, Donna, for really a great conversation. 
Thank you.